Hey, hey, everybody. Welcome on in to ClayShare Live. I'm Jessica Putnam Phillips, and this is our weekly live broadcast where we do a fun little tutorial for you. And tonight we are going to be glazing with Mako Stoneware Glazes. I've got some finished pieces here to share with you all. And uh, I've got some pieces to glaze, and we'll talk a bit about the Mako Glazes. Now, just so we're all on the same page, these are all food safe. I'm not using any glazes tonight at all that are not food safe. So everything you see me use, you can use on food, just so you know, right? Because I don't want anybody worrying about that. That's always a big question that comes up. I don't use things on foodware that's not food safe. So when you see me glazing, you can pretty much safely say that it's fine. But I just wanted to put it out there just to start it off on that page. And uh, I got this handy dandy poster. I don't know where I'm going to put it in the studio, but it's Mako Stoneware Glazes. It's a really nice reference material. You know, you can make your own test tiles or you could just glaze a whole bunch of pieces and have them in your studio. But to be honest, you're not going to want to keep this many examples of finished pots just sitting there. We need to sell them and make money so we can buy more glazes, right? So this poster right here, it's a pretty great reference and I do use it and it's often hanging in a location where I can easily see it. Although right now where I have it hanging, you guys can't see it. So I grabbed it so that you all could go ahead and see. Hi everybody. You need the poster. I got it directly from Mako. Um, I think Mako distributors will probably have them. But let me see if I can find out. Go to makocolors.com. That's their website. And check to see if they have like reference materials or resource materials there that you guys can request. But I will check with Drew at Clayscapes and see if they get extras of these because it's a great thing to have. It's a really nice thing to have. Perfect class for you right now because you're glazing and you got a lot of pieces to do. All right, good, good. So these are all going to be cone five, cone six firing temperatures. I am using Laguna B-Mix as my bisqueware, so that's a light colored clay, and that's what I'm going to be glazing tonight, and that's the examples I have here to show for you, to you all. And again, everything is food safe. So let's just start out with, we'll just show some pieces right here. So I'll put this, I don't know uh, what camera, you're going to go to two, three, four, seven, eight. I'm, I follow you. <laughs> he follows me. So this one right here is one I did with the peacock glazing technique. This is actually a class. I teach you how to make this tray, and then we make do the glazing all in one class. Um, I did do another tutorial, which was just peacock glazing, because we had so many requests. And in that one, we did this piece here and this cup. So we did these two pieces. Now, um, I'm not doing peacock glazing tonight because we've already done that. So we're gonna do something a little different, but I'm sure we'll do more peacock glazing as time goes on. But it's still all Mako products. The key to peacock glazing is you put your, you, it's, it's actually really, really simple. You put your flux on first, you make your little Ws, you do your color spots, which are what these bright colors are. I use stroke and coat, and then you just put a glaze on top of the whole thing, like we have on this piece right here, so you can see. But I just wanted to put it out there because I love how these turn out. All right, let me show you some non-peacock glaze pieces. So you can get some really beautiful effects, even if you don't do the peacock glazing technique. Um, Pierce Bowl class, we did this. It's Lavender Mist, which is a Mako stonework glaze. And on top, this is Blue Hydrangea and then Light Flux. So the Blue Hydrangea is one of Mako's glazes that have crystals in it. And it's also the glaze I use on the rim of this pink cup right here is blue hydrangea. It is also the glaze I use on this rim of this little mushroom pourer. This is a syrup pourer or creamer without a handle or a little mini gravy pourer, whatever you want to call it. The purple on this though is Amico's lavender celadon. So I use a different purple on this one here. So lavender mist, you can see is more of an opaque glaze than the lavender celadon. Yeah, and Mako does, Connie just has a great point here. Mako has a fabulous online resource for glaze combos and they have a YouTube channel that is amazing. So if you're not following Mako on YouTube, go find them. They have lots of great tutorials 
And um, we've worked with Mako for a few years here at Clayshare, and they've done for ClayshareCon a lot of demos with us and everything. And we just love the folks at Mako. Lavender Mist again, but it's a great one for texture. So this is a Lavender Mist with just the flux, light flux on the rim. And I know there's going to be questions about the flux. Flux is just a glaze product that Mako makes. They make a light flux and a dark flux. The difference being is the light flux is a white to light gray, almost purpley sometimes, and the dark flux is a dark gray. So you can see on the rim of this is dark flux, and then on the rim of this is light flux. And you can really see what this one has done when you look down the, on the interior, how that light flux melts and runs down in. It's confusing for those of us that know glaze chemistry because a flux is a, a component of a glaze. It's something that melts a lot. And it's a little difficult when commercial glazes call themselves an ingredient. That would be like, you know, you go to buy a muffin and it's called a, a like cornstarch. It's just, it's an ingredient, it's a component. But anyhow, here's another great one for texture if you have a lot of texture on your pieces. This is Mako's Green Tea. So that's another really nice stoneware glaze. And I did use their copper wash first and wipe that back. So that gives a little more depth to that piece there. All right, I'm gonna go through these a little more, get the rest of these shown to you guys because I want to get glazing. I, we have pots to glaze and it always takes me a, a while. Sweet little set I did. This is the Funky Teapot from the Funky Teapot class. And the yellow, this is the, um, I got it back there. What is this? Lemon, frosted lemon, frosted lemon. And what's great about frosted lemon is it works really well with texture. So if you want a yellow, a nice soft yellow, the frosted lemon two coats will get you there. But it's also nice as just a regular base glaze if you like the yellow. And what I did is I put the frosted lemon on, two coats, a little band of blue hydrangea, and then a band of light flux. And light flux is what's given us this purple melty down the handle here. And again, same thing here. Same combo, just more of the blue hydrangea. I went further down the mug with the blue hydrangea on this one than I did on this. Because this didn't have texture, so I knew the glaze could really melt and run and be the highlight. This had texture, so I wanted to highlight that texture. Lisa, how did I make the dish with the cutouts? Lisa Leslie, I cannot believe you haven't watched the class. It's the pierced bowl class. How have you missed this? You've got to go watch it. This is a hand building class on Clayshare. Just pierced bowl. It's... <laughs> Facebook, Facebook's helping Kevin out. He's having a bit of a fit right now, but he'll, he'll make it. Same exact combo as this, except I used pink opal on the mug as my underglaze. So I put the pink opal on it all the way to here. Hope you guys are taking notes. Y you can go back and rewatch this. It's fine. Um, pink opal to here, blue hydrangea here, and then light flux, two coats on the rim. We got more. Let's get through these so I can. The funky teapot, yeah, I've got it. I, I do the funky teapot in melty. I like, like it really melty and runny. And um, This gives you a really nice example of the blue hydrangea by itself. It has little specks of yellow in it. It's a purple. It's a purple with specks of yellow. It's really pretty, though. It's really pretty. And there's the top. You can see the little bit on the rim. Hi, folks from Maryland and New Jersey. All right, more pink opal <laughs> with uh, Celadon Bloom on top. Just that. Two coats of pink opal and then two coats of Celadon Bloom. So if you're a pinky purple person and you like these colors, this is for you. And then if you love Celadon Bloom, which I love Celadon Bloom. I get a lot of comments when I put anything with Celadon Bloom up on social media because people are always saying it looks like mold because you got the blooming and the growing of the crystals right here. But the fact is, 
when we think about things in nature growing, be it mold or crystals, they grow in similar, similar structures. So it's, um, it's the way it is, it's nature. And is it a bad thing? Why is mold not beautiful? I, I don't know, I think it is. So Celadon Bloom on this bowl, two coats, and then just on the rim, two coats of light flux, heavily applied. And it runs, 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 it runs. Beautifully though, I love it. This is very beachy to me, I think it's great. But it's not everybody's cup of tea, so don't do this glaze if you don't like that. I never understand people who have to be like, ugh, that's terrible, it looks like mold. And like, why do you have to say anything at all? Just go on by and find something you like. There's plenty out there. All right, because I need more lavender mist in my life. Two coats of lavender mist on the entire bowl. Dark flux, one coat, light flux, one coat. And you see how it melts? Super melty. <laughs> Same thing on this right here, but watch out, because I'm not kidding about super melty. Look at that, melted right down, melty melt right there. So that's that one. And then this combo I'm gonna show you we're gonna do tonight. This is one of my favorites. I call it the Starry Night Combo because it's blue opal on the entire piece, two coats, and then night moth on top. And night moth by itself is a black based glaze, but when you put it on top of a blue glaze, it does this. Doesn't that look like Starry Night? The sky from Van Gogh, or Van Gogh, depending where you live, right? How you say it? There's probably other ways to say it. Um, one more, again, with the pink opal. This isn't one I'm in love with. I'm still working on uh, what else I would do to this. I think I might refire it with some dark flux. Pink opal and shipwreck, two coats of each. It's just not winning for me today, I don't know. I'll do something to it. Maybe we'll put dark flux and refire it. We'll see what happens. Because other than that, it's a great bowl. And it's very disappointing to have such a good shape and then the glaze go meh on you. You've ha yet to have anybody not like Celadon Bloom. Yeah, I, you know, it's, um, it's interesting when you put things out in the world and the people who will comment on stuff, but when they see it in person, it's a whole different thing, right? Okay, so let's, let's do some glazing. We're gonna do the Night Moth uh, Blue Opal combo first. And I've got a mug we're gonna glaze with that. And this is a mug we threw together a, a few weeks ago, we went ahead and did a wheel throwing demo, but you could do a hand built one. It doesn't have to be wheel thrown. It's entirely up to you. Starry night is heaven. Yeah, so that's just, let me grab it. It's night moth right here and blue opal. So it's just these two glazes together. And Night Moth, you can put on top of a lot of different glazes and it changes the color tones in it. So it's, an, it's a really fun glaze to play with and experiment with. So we're just gonna do paint on glaze. This is gonna be really, really simple approach. And I've got a bunch of brushes. And so I buy my glazes from Clayscapes Pottery. That's where I get my Mako glazes. They have most everything I need, and if they don't have it in stock, they can order it. I also use Mako brushes, so I got a couple Mako fan brushes. This are number, this is actually a Royal Alqualon, but this is a Mako number four, this is also a Mako, and this is a Mako. I believe they changed their handles and now they're clear, but don't hold me to that, because look, <laughs> look at the difference. A well-used brush, a new, one I've never used before. Uh, it's tough to be a brush in a potter studio. <laughs> All right, so we're going to start with the blue opal here. <laughs> you remember when you first watched the live and you fell in love with lavender mist and made you need to start glazing pottery and firing ASAP? I, if I'm left to my own devices, I will put lavender mist on everything. You know, I haven't done lavender mist with night moth yet. Maybe we'll do that, I don't know. Maybe we'll get there tonight. 
It would look good with the blue on the bottom. That's the plan. We're going to do blue first. You don't have blue open, a blue opal, <clears throat> blue open. Could you sub? Um, I would think you could do Norse blue, Capri blue. You're looking for a medium denim blue tone. So any blue should get you there. Give it a try. What do you got to lose? Are you able to zoom in the camera enough mm -hmm. so that people can see where we're going? All right, I'm gonna do a quick brush, brush on. I'm gonna pull the Insta folks down so they can see what's happening. See a little better. They don't see my face, you know. All right, so I'm just gonna go on in. Might wanna do. And I just kind of swirl it around. Now you could do what's called rolling, R-O-L-L-I-N-G, rolling or rollin', if you wanna say it, cool, um, glaze, where you pour the glaze inside, roll it around and pour it out. And even though it's a brush on glaze, you can still do that with it. But it's so fast to brush it on that I just brush it on. And so you'll notice it's drying really fast. And you just wanna wait for the shine to go away and then you can put it on again. What is the green triangle tray? Oh, I didn't show that. So it's not actually green. This is cenote, which is a Mako stoneware glaze, all by itself. That's it. Nothing else on here, just two coats of cenote. But it's a blue-green. It's a really pretty glaze. It's food safe. It has dark brown and tan specks in it. So it's a very user-friendly glaze, I like to say. So if you're starting out and you're wondering what glaze to go with, this is a good one if you want some specks in it. I haven't tried, um, I haven't tried this on texture. I think the specks might get in the way and be a little distracting. <laughs> Therese, yeah, 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 you're got a sharp eye. <laughs> All right, let's go ahead and get our second coat. It's almost dry. See how it's kind of chalky looking inside there? That's what we want. All right, I read a question. If I had to choose one, would I buy first Stroke & Co or Amico Velvet Underglaze? Shelly, that is a tough question because a Stroke & Co is a glaze by itself. So with a Stroke & Co, you can use that as a glaze or as a, as a way to color, thin it down and color your pieces as a watercolor effect or for staining. But an underglaze, a velvet underglaze is gonna need a glaze on top. The other side of that is you couldn't put the stroke and coat on the bottom of a pot, it would stick to your shelf. So if you're gonna use it for signing, like I use, that would be a consideration. All right, let's go ahead and put our second coat on. And we'll just start this time at the top. And just as it drips down in, I just keep following it down. Two coats is good on the inside. If you wanna put a third, you can. It'll just give you more complete coverage. I find two does the job nicely and, you know, get you the color payoff you want. You don't need to go that, that third coat, but it, you know, hey, it's your piece. You, you do what you want. So that's our coat, and it's a little messy, so I like to go back in and just clean up any drips, because sometimes these drips will show through. You'll put a layer on top, and you'll have that little bit of a drip, and depending on what you're doing, you might not want that there. Because we're putting so many layers on the top of this, it wouldn't show. That drip would not show for this combo. But if I was doing a, a different combo, it could. You have Mako Midnight Rain, and it's like cenote, but more blue. Ooh, Sonora. I don't have that glaze. I don't have all the Mako glazes. I know it seems like I do, but I don't. So what would happen if you had underglaze and you didn't glaze on top? Uh, Christine. Let me show you right here. This is, this is Speedball Black Underglaze on the bottom. And it's just gonna be like this. Here it is on a fired piece. So do you see how it is? This is bisque, this is fired. And it's completely vitrified on the clay, but it's matte. So you get a matte finish. And that's how I like to sign my pieces. So you don't have to put a glaze on top of it. If your clay goes to top temperature and vitrifies, you're fine. Lisa's cutting out templates while she watches. Woo that's a good way to spend your, your evening, or depending on what time it is, wherever you are. 
So it would not be like a matte glaze. It would be like a matte glaze, yeah. It would be very similar to one. But a matte glaze could seal up a piece where under glaze won't. All right, so I didn't wax the bottom. I did wipe these down with a damp sponge before starting just to get any dust off. But I did not wax the bottoms. If I'm brushing on glaze, I don't usually do that. If I'm dipping and pouring, I will wax the bottoms. So let's go ahead and start. The blue opal, I know that I can do one coat right to the bottom and it will be fine. I don't have to worry about one coat running, but my second coat can't go that far down. That way that I, I don't end up with unglazed clay, although sometimes I do wipe it back if I've got a very drippy glaze on top of it and I wanna make sure that there's bare clay that'll help catch and slow down those drips. Get up in the handle. Now I'm gonna sit it on my banding wheel and I'm just gonna finish. So for the effect we want, what we need to have is we need to have blue under the black. So I need to make sure I have the blue all the way to the top. If I was doing, let me find it. If I was doing this, the yellow only goes to here. Do you see the tone difference between here and down in here. This is because this is blue hydrangea on top of yellow. It kind of grays it down a little bit. Blue hydrangea by itself, it, it's stronger. So just keep that in mind. Sometimes you just want that color by itself, this color by itself, and then they have an overlap and it changes how they look. Same thing with this one. The pink only goes to here. You can really tell on the pink. Blue hydrangea over pink, Blue hydrangea by itself with light flux on top. So just keep that in mind when you're working because you'll get different results depending on how you do it. This is the number eight Mako Soft Fan Brush. You'll often see me using the clear version, the clear handled version. Um, somebody tell me if the clear handle, th this is made by Mako as well. Same brush, different handle. I don't know if they changed handles for going clear, going to blue, I don't know, but my mama got me these for Christmas, so I'm using these. I hadn't used them yet. They were sitting on my desk and I was um, in there doing emails and I looked over at them and I was like, why are these not in the studio? So I just brought them to the studio where they live now. All right, so I'm going close to the bottom, but not quite down with the blue opal. I do think having a brush that can, do you see how much glaze this holds so much? That's just covered up in glaze. And that way I can just almost get the whole thing without dipping back in because there's so much material on the brush. You know, if you have a teeny tiny brush, it can make it difficult to get nice, even coverage. So that looks, that looks good. If it's too thick and you get any drips, just go back with your brush and catch them. All right, so this one needs to sit until it's dry and then we can put our second coat on, our second color on. And while it's drying, we'll move on to another piece. Using iron wash and can't remember if it sticks to the shelf. If the iron wash is wiped back, you should be fine. But if the iron wash is full strength, it can stick. So just uh, keep that in mind. All right, so we've got a couple heart bowls. I thought we'd do uh, those. And what do you guys want me to do? You wanna pick? This is the choose your own glazing. You've seen me share a bunch of combos. Um, sweet little bowl. We threw these in a broadcast back in February. You can go watch the replay of that, making heart bowls. It was really a fun tutorial. We've got a couple different sizes, but they're actually these two are the same size, but I did throw some bigger ones. <laughs> I actually made one a batter bowl. Uh, I haven't glazed it yet. I need, I need to.
What is the yellow and the blue hydrangea? So the, well, let's do that. Lemon, that would be frosted lemon. Let's do the yellow. I've got more bowls. We can do multiples. Frosted lemon, and then the one on top is blue hydrangea. Did I grab the blue hydrangea? Here it is. Blue hydrangea. And then you put light flux. The light flux makes it meltier and one more. Let's do that on the bowl. Yeah. Sorry if you didn't say it soon, soon enough. <laughs> Rich says, I have put less glaze on a whole pot than that brush will hold. <laughs> I mean, sometimes you gotta be, uh, you, gotta, you gotta save up your glazing, huh? You gotta save up your glaze. So here's the thing with the yellow. When we put the yellow under, remember the yellow under the blue hydrangea, you get more of a grayed down effect. Blue hydrangea by itself, you get more of the, the blues and purples coming out. So just keep that in mind. So on the inside, I'm going to do all yellow. But on the outside, I'm only going to do the yellow, I'm thinking two-thirds of the way up. That way I have room for the blue hydrangea to shine. Now blue hydrangea is a slightly translucent glaze, just so you know. Something bright and summery, that'll be perfect with the yellow, right? So I got the number four Mako. That's what we'll go with for glazing. Lemon and night moth. How is the night moth on yellow? Like, what does that do? So I'm gonna do one coat on the inside. And if you put it on your banding wheel or a turntable and you spin it like this, it gives a nice little swirly and it just works really well on the inside so you don't have brush strokes. These melt really well so you rarely have brush strokes anyways, but if you're using a glaze that can leave behind brush strokes, just put it on and swirl it. So I didn't get to the rim, that's because I'm going to turn it over and we'll do the outside. <laughs> Thanks Molly. I didn't think, I'm like, nobody's going to notice. I had six inches cut off. I said a trim. My hairdresser took it upon herself to decide what I needed to have done. <laughs> Not sure how I feel about it yet, but we'll see. All righty. Back on track. So going with the yellow, I'm going to put my line, so I'm stopping here with the yellow. So I'm just going to use my brush. It doesn't have to be perfectly even, your line. Like if, if it's got a little undulation happening, I think it works for it always. I think it works better. But we're gonna have a nice yellow, yellow bottom. And again, the frosted lemon, one coat will stay put really well. So as long as my second coat, I don't go near the bottom. If I stop it about here, I should be fine. I shouldn't have to have um, any worries about it running. Is it true that winter wood is porous? Winter wood is a matte glaze. It can sometimes give you issues and not vitrify all the way. I have heard some folks have problems as well with it. I don't use winter wood. I, I bought or got a sample of it, I think back when it first came out, and I've, I've not really used it much. It looks pretty, but I haven't used it much, mostly because it's a matte glaze, and I do tend to not go in for the matte glaze as much. If your clay is vitrified, then it really doesn't matter what you put on it. It will just be a nice dry matte. So maybe the folks that are having problems with it staying porous are not vitrifying their clay, which means they're not taking it to the top temperature that the manufacturer recommends you go to. I'm using Laguna B-Mix 5. Laguna recommends that I go to cone 5 with this, so I do. Although some folks go to cone 6, you can go hotter than the recommended temp, and it's vitrified. You just got to watch out for what's called bloat, and bloat is where you get what looks like little bubbles in the clay. It looks like the clay itself's like got an air bubble caught in it. 
And that happens a lot with dark clays. Darker clays are usually five, cone five, cone, cone four. They like cone four a lot. All right, so that's our two coats. Just clean the foot up as we go. I'll wipe it again before I put it in the kiln. But, so we're gonna let this dry. See how shiny it is. Put that to the side. And now we can go back to our blue opal piece that we're gonna put the night moth on. You love winter wood under almost anything glossy. Yeah, and that's the thing about matte glazes. If you're gonna use them, I do think it's best to put a gloss glaze on top. You know, it's a nice contrast, that matte with the gloss. I think winter wood with light flux is beautiful. All right, so we're gonna get into the night moth. And night moth is one of the crystalline line of glazes that they make. And so you'll notice when I stir this up, there's crystal chunks. Now these are not the same as crystalline glazes like um, Andy Boswell's crystalline glaze. They're a totally different thing. This has got some materials, little inclusions added to it that those little like hard specks that are in here will melt and kind of open up and spread out and give you crystals, but it's totally different than a true crystalline glaze. But this is a nice way to get a similar look to a crystalline glaze without the chemistry part. So this is a nice one for anybody at any level. Just starting making pottery, you can use these glazes. So let me stir this up a bit, see how thick it is. It's like pudding. That's all right though. Like a tea dust effect. Um, with the, with you put the gloss on top of the winter wood, um, it melts and runs a bit. I, I have one piece somewhere, but I'm not sure where it is that I've used winter wood on. I have to find that. All right, let's go ahead with the night moth. And you just, I'm gonna scrape to get those chunkies. And we want the blue to show. You pick how much blue shows through. With this one, you see, I didn't, I didn't leave much room. I really went close to the bottom, three quarters of the way down. The night moth runs, so I think two thirds is a safer bet. So I'm just gonna go to right about where the handle stops. Start a little higher first. I'm just gonna do a band and work my way around. I don't know if you can see those crystals as I'm brushing them on, the little chunkies. See them in there, the chunky crystal? So those are actually going to melt. And do you see the little like specks on here? That's what those crystals are. That's exactly what it's gonna look like. So everywhere there's one of those little specks on this, one of the little bumps, you're gonna get an effect like here and here and here. Now, if you put these too close to the bottom, they could run, the little chunky crystals. Some folks like to not mix the glaze up much when they start with their first coat, when they're using the crystal glazes, so they don't get any of the chunkies on. And if I was just using the crystal glaze without a base color under it, then I would do that. But because we used that blue opal under it, I went ahead and just stirred it up. Now where handles are, you're gonna get more running. You know, the, the vertical melt is stronger. You're gonna get a lot of op opportunity for running, which, which could be a little bit of an issue, but see how I've left a little space so I can afford the run to happen there. The other thing I do with the crystals is if any get on the rim, before it's dry all the way, I will take them off the rim and I'll just put them somewhere else here. I'll, get, I'll put one on the rim so that I can move it to show you what I'm talking about. Because what can happen is sometimes if they're right on the rim of a piece, sometimes they uh, don't melt as smoothly on the rim and they can leave a little rough spot. They don't do it on the side because again, it's, gravity is pulling it down. As it's melting in the kiln, gravity is pulling it, it's running. When it's sitting right here on the top, it's melting, but it, it's sitting on a flat surface, so gravity's not pulling it down. And I'm gonna get the inside. This, 
get a little a little bit of the melting down in. All right, so I have got a few, and you just take your finger, and I don't know if you can see. I can get the camera to focus on my hand. Do you see? I have a little. I have a one right here on my finger, and then I just take it and I just stick it somewhere else. That's it. You just pull it off the rim, and sometimes I just knock it off the rim and I just pull it down just to the outside of the rim, just so it's not on the top of the rim. Now, if you're firing a really hot kiln, you won't have an issue. Cone five, they melt, but if you're going six or seven, they're going to melt and run a lot more, so you wouldn't really have to worry about this. But on my, my cone five, I have had roughness where the crystals are in the past. All right, so we're going to let this dry. We want to do two coats. Our second coat, we won't come as far down because it'll melt a lot. So we're only going to come about halfway down the pot with the second coat. So let's put this to the side and we can go to our yellow one. What works well over alabaster? Um, alabaster is a really nice light base color. You can put anything that has a lot of movement and a lot of crystallization on top of that. I, I don't really use alabaster much because it's just kind of neutral. I know we had during ClayshareCon, uh, was it Carmen was on from Mako, and she gave some good examples of things with alabaster. And you can watch that video. That's, you know, all of ClayshareCon is available for free, so you guys can check that out. So when you use a matte on the outside and a gloss inside, you get crazing almost every time. So what you have there is you have glazes that are shrinking at different rates on the inside and on the outside of your pot. So the only thing you can do is change your clay because it's an incompatibility issue between the two glazes and the clay. They might never work together on that clay. So you can try changing clay or putting different glazes on the inside and the outside, like going with the same gloss on the inside. I have found that as well. Matte, some matte glazes and gloss glazes, you think about it, they're shrinking at different rates and one is pulling more than the other and the, the gloss one, it's usually the gloss that does the crazing. And is that on the outside or is the on the inside? Let me see if the, um, the comments scrolled on by. Can you put Mako on top of Amico? I can visually answer that for you. Right here. Amico Lavender Celadon. Mako Blue Hydrangea, Mako Light Flux. One of my all-time favorite combos. Any Amico Celadon that you want to use, you can, and put a Mako glaze on top. Absolutely. I have never had a bad result with the Amico Celadons. I haven't tried every potter's choice with them, but I know that all the Celadons work nicely. So matte on your outside and gloss inside, right. So your gloss, it's, it just, it's shrinking too much. So Michelle, you could also try slowing your firing down a lot, like do a really slow fire. That could help as well, but it may never work for you. All right, so we did frosted lemon, we did our two coats, and now we're ready to do our blue hydrangea on this. And I'm gonna go ahead and do the outside first. And I got the blue hydrangea right here. You love alabaster with green tea and Norse blue and cenote. All right, I'll have to remember that and try it because I haven't done that yet. Because I use so many different glazes, I, I never get to try all the combos. So you guys are such a good source for me. All right. Blue Hydrangea, again, is another one of those glazes that has the chunks, the crystals in it. And remember, this is a purple translucent base that has little specks of yellow in it. I don't know if you can see on that test tile there. Looks very much like that. But it's really nice on top of things. So I'm going to put this on upside down, and I'm going to start about halfway down the bowl, I want a little bit of overlap. And the reason I'm putting it on upside down is so if there's any dripping, it goes towards the top. I don't want runs down to the bottom. At least not, not with this combo. Okay. 
Let me put that on. Now I've got some little crystals that are on my banding wheel, so I will go and scoop them up and I will just put them on manually. The other option is you could put this on top of something so that when you're glazing it, you're not actually brushing on the banding wheel. But it's really not a lot of glaze that's on there, so we'll just clean that up. Yep, I think I'm going to go ahead and do the second coat, and I'm going to hold it for this. And we're just going to brush that on. So that'll be two coats of the blue hydrangea. Now for this to dry, what I'll usually do is I'll find something, usually it's going to be a jar of glaze or underglaze, and I will set this to the side on that object, just like that. So if the glaze runs or drips, it just does it. But I don't have to worry about anything touching the rim. So that's going to sit and dry. Let's check on our mug and see if we're ready. All right, mug's not quite ready yet, so let's glaze another piece. Let's start doing another combo. Colonial white is a very strong glaze. If you use it as a liner glaze, you need to thin it down or it may crack. So that's the other thing. Yeah, Judy has a, has a good suggestion as well. You know, she brings up something. If the glaze is really thick, you can get more crazing. So maybe you need to thin it down. A celadon over a satin. Yeah, so let's talk about that. When we're putting on glazes, we have glazes that are, are three different finishes, just like when you buy paint in a store, right? So you have a gloss finish, which is our shiny. You have a satin, which isn't quite a high gloss. It's, it's down a bit. And then you have matte. So those are your three different finish levels, matte, satin, and gloss. And so it's easy to remember because you can put a matte on, and then you can put a satin on a matte, and you can put a gloss on a matte without any issues. They can go over the matte. With a satin, you can put a gloss over the satin, but if you're putting a matte over the satin, sometimes you get glaze fit issues. And then with the gloss, same thing, you have to do tests, but sometimes with a satin or a matte, they don't fit as well. They just shrink at different rates. So you're almost always safe to start with a matte first, and then you can put a satin on a matte, and you can put a gloss on a satin and a gloss on a matte. So I hope that's, that's a, a, little, a little thing to remember when you're glazing. If you do matte first, you can put basically everything over it. But gloss, you got to do tests. Sometimes you can get away with it, but not always. Shiny on the top, exactly. You want to make a copper wash. Can you make it with copper carbonate? Absolutely, you can make it, Libby. Just take some copper carbonate, add a bit of water till it thins down to the consistency of an ink, and that's it. You made a copper wash. Yeah, that's exactly what you've done. You don't have to do anything else, just water and copper. It will melt a lot and run a lot, so keep that in mind when you're using it. All right, did we come with a, do you want to do a lavender mist combo? Yeah? Let's. I agree, we should. So I got the lavender mist, and uh, this is the Royal Aqualon that I use on my Mako brushes. They're all occupied. We're going to try this one. So this is Royal Langnickel, makes a line of brushes. This is their Aqualon. It's a number 12. You'll see it's a little flatter, but we're going to give it a try and see what happens with it. It's warm in the studio. <laughs> it's warm. We're having crazy heat wave here. Um, it's like somebody flipped a switch in Vermont. We had snow less than two weeks ago, and today it's uh, like 76. It's crazy. It's the Beyonce effect. Yes, with my yeah, blowing around everything. <laughs> so Lavender Mist is a great glaze for texture. It's a great glaze for dark clay. It's a great glaze for light clay. Um, I have done Lavender Mist on speckled clay, and it's beautiful there. So if you're a speckled or dark clay lover, 
you will love lavender mist. The um, frosted lemon is nice on the darker clays too. I need to do more dark clay. I'm such a B-mix girl. I've got I've to break out of my B-mix safety zone. And with this one, we're going to put the lavender mist on the entire thing. This brush works all right. It's a little flatter. You can see. See how it's not as fluffy? But it works. It does hold plenty of glaze, so that makes me happy. Can I repeat the glaze combo in the Pierce Bowl? Absolutely. Let me grab it while he's dry. So this is Lavender Mist to here. You can kind of see. Blue Hydrangea from here, from the outside in to here. Then Light Flux on the rim and Light Flux here, just a band. So I just brushed with a Sumi brush. That's this brush here. A band of it just around the rim and a band of it in here. Two, two coats of the band. Two coats Lavender Mist, two coats Blue Hydrangea, two coats of the Light Flux. And again, check out the Pierce Bowl class. Here's the backside so you can see how it looks. I actually kept this one for my own collection. I don't, I, I don't have another Pierce Bowl that I've ever kept that I've made. Um, I just love the way this one came out. It turned out really lovely. See what I was talking about? This is not a wheel thrown bowl. This is a hand built bowl. But because I glazed it on the banding wheel, it has that little swirl. Isn't that a nice little effect? I'm not pretending I threw it. I mean, I freely admit this was a slab bowl. I, I really don't care that it was made that way. But I do like the way this happens. And we get that little curly cue in there. It's just something nice. The little swirl. It's very um, iconic pottery, right? So where Michelle is, it went straight from 60s to 90s, right? What is this crazy weather we're having? It's going to be hot here for the next, like, six days. I'm, it's crazy. But I'll take it because uh, it's been so cold for so long. We had frost? Yeah. I mean, it's been 32 at night, so it's not hot. It's not hot at night. It just gets hot during the day. All right, so... Two coats of the lavender mist on this. Let's flip it over. We'll do a second coat on the inside. And this one we're going to do fluxes. We'll do the two fluxes, the light flux and the dark flux on this one. Let's get a second coat on the inside. Now this bowl was wheel thrown. So it already has a swirl in it. But if I just brush and let the brush roll along down there, it just fills in that little, little swirl that's in there. Got to get the rim. So last week we premiered our rim templates. And we think we have five designs available right now. And today's the last day of the introductory price. We will be putting them on sale from time to time. Premium members always get a discount. But I just wanted to let all the folks know that they go to their regular price today. Tomorrow. They go to the regular price tomorrow. But still, they're really affordable. And I'm going to keep working on designs for you guys. So we'll keep getting more out there. And you don't have to rush to get them. I do plan to put them all on sale from time to time. That's, you know. But I want to remind you all what's going on with that. All right, so we want to do a little bit of the blue hydrangea. Switch back to the blue hydrangea bowl. And I'm going to do one more coat just really close to the rim and then on the rim. Do you see how I'm just pulling the brush across the rim? And what this is doing is, I don't know if you can see, it's depositing a lot of glaze on it so it's dripping down inside. There we go. There's a good section. Let me show you that. There. 
<laughs> so if you want to mimic the look of drips, you just pull your brush across. And that'll make it drippy. We are going to put flux on this, though. And again, because this has crystals, I just want to make sure there's none right on the edges. Since we're going to flux this, it's going to melt a lot, so I don't have to worry about those crystals. They will melt in for this particular piece. All right, put that to the side. Can we go back to the one with, yes. Oh, we have some nice, oh, we got some nice stuff happening. Let me show you what's going on here. The night moth has dripped. It shouldn't move too much. It'll move a little. It'll move about a quarter of an inch in the firing. So this will drip down to about where my finger is now. So it won't go too far down, but it will move. And it'll give that nice drippy effect. But you can kind of see those drippy bits there. And up here you can see where the glaze is drying, where it's the light gray instead of the dark gray. So this just needs one more coat of the night moth, and that's it. We don't do anything else to it. You let it dry all the way, and then you fire it. Flex over or under the glaze. So um, it's up to you. You get a different effect depending which way you put it on. I usually put the flux so when I'm doing the pe All right, so here's just two different ways. When I'm doing peacock glazing technique, the flux goes on first, goes under the glaze. When I'm doing just straight glazing, no peacock effect, I put the flux on after. So let's just start with the rim. Our second coat. And I'm going to put this on the inside too. It's really, this jar of glaze is very thick. And remember, I said I wasn't going to go all the way down because it will run. So I'm only going to go about halfway down the pot. There. That's it. Make sure you get up on the the inside of the handle, right up in here. This part here, I, if I forget to glaze a spot, it's this spot up, up under there. You'll take it out of the kiln, you'll turn it over, look up at the handle right up in here, and it's bare. And you're like, no, what did I do? What didn't I do, right? I didn't glaze there. So you glaze it again and put it back in the kiln. And for when, for when I reglaze, I don't do anything fancy. I just wipe the piece with rubbing alcohol, and then I put my glaze on. Ooh, we got a new drip started from the handle. Wait, let me turn around so you can see. Right here, right there. All right, let me put this away so it can dry. I won't touch this again until it's completely dry. See how wet it is? We're not gonna mess with it. We're gonna put it to the side. We're gonna let it be. And we'll come back to that after it's dry. But it might take an hour. The blue pitcher to my left. This was an extruded pitcher. I extruded a big old tube and then I darted it. I have a class, um, the, sassy, the sassy mug class. I show you all how to do darts on a hand-built cylinder. Well, instead of hand-building the cylinder, I just extruded it and then I darted it. So I made, a, I made a bunch of these. These are the only two I've got left, so I kept them. This one ran and stuck to the shelf, so that's why I kept this one, and this is my example. All right, back to the, uh, where are we at now? Oh, we can do the lavender mist one. I think we're ready to do our fluxes on the lavender mist. So let me get a brush for that. So this one I start with the dark flux first, and then light flux on top of the dark flux. Dark flux is going to be grayer, it's going to be darker, as the name suggests, and then light flux is a lighter gray. So I want a lighter on top. The deep, like, richness of the dark color will shine through. Do you see how we have the depth from the darker? So we'll do the dark flux, there it is on the inside, first, and then the light flux. So we'll go 
a little bit further down with the dark, but not much. And I've got a Sumi brush. This is probably a medium sized bamboo handle brush. And then here's my Dark Flux. Dark Flux is basically just a dark gray glaze that melts like crazy. The, you like to do the dark over the light. I think that's the difference between the two here, Rich. I think this one here is dark flux over the light flux, and this one here is light flux over the dark flux. Do you see the difference? Do you see how you have the dark, more brown on the pitcher? And then we have lighter, more purpley blue on the bowl? Is everything else is the same? Light flux over dark flux, dark flux over light flux. You pick which one you like better. I'm going to do the dark flux first because I said I would. So I'm going to stick with that. But yeah, Rich, you're right on that. Thanks for catching that for me. Dark flux. I'm going to do a band almost halfway down. You can use dark flux by itself if you want to. It's just a dark gray glaze that melts a lot. I have never used it alone. But you could. I don't know what it would do. Run. <laughs> so there, about halfway down. I'm going to do two coats of that. Um, both the fluxes are food safe. They don't have really anything in them. And when I say they don't have anything in them, it means some glazes, no matter how much you put on, they have nothing in them that's not food safe, so they could never hurt you. So that's what I mean when I say that. And if you want to know exactly what's in a glaze and you're concerned, you can always reach out to a glaze manufacturer. They won't tell you the recipes, you know, because they're not going to want you to go make it yourself, but they'll tell you what's in it so you can have that information. All right, so two coats of the dark flux. Dark flux is like very thick. So it's a very thick material. All right, let this dry. <laughs> now, come back to our blue hydrangea bowl because we're switching to light flux. You like the effect on the pitcher better. So Judy, when you do it, do it the other way, right? So that's the great thing about it. And that's why I love when I teach you guys how to do stuff and you do it your way because I'm just teaching you the skills or giving you possibilities, right? So if you like the dark over light, you like the pitcher. If you like the light over the dark, you like the bowl. It's just up to you. And so, you know, when, we, when you see two potters that have made the same thing, the same form, but they don't look exactly alike and they're not glazed exactly the same way, it's, it's, it's the one thing... I think that's why potters, we always share all of our information, can't wait to teach others because, you know, painters can be cagey, right? They don't want to share, they don't want to share how they did stuff, but potters are like, yeah, I'll show you, I'll tell you, you know, because we know everybody does it differently. All right, light flux time. This is the frosted lemon, the light flux. And we're going to put a band on the outside. If you can't get these Sumi brushes, just a fat round brush, like a eight, a number eight round should work well, maybe a 10. But the Sumi are good. They're usually $3 a brush, pretty inexpensive. And they take a beating. And if you get them from a teacher supply store, you can often get a like pack of, of them for a really great price. All right, so let me teach you a little, a little technique. We're gonna roll, we're gonna put our brush on and we're gonna roll it as I pull across. Can you see what I just did? Do you see right, right in there, that melty little bit? See that little bead? It's hard to see from the angle you're at, but you just twist 
I'm twisting the brush as I'm putting it on. So instead of just brushing, instead of just brushing it straight on, I'm twisting the brush on that rim and it's allowing the glaze to be applied a little unevenly. So I'm gonna get some dripping, which is what I want, but not a sheet, just like a straight wall of drip. It's gonna create um, a little bit of an uneven dripping, which I really like the look of. Okay, we're gonna finish this up, but we're about out of time. And uh, there's never enough time. I'm always thinking I'm gonna glaze everything and then, nope. All right, let's do this one. Get the second coat. Sometimes with the flux, I don't wait to do the second coat until it's dry, I just go right in. All right, let me show you what I was talking about. See how we have lots of drippies up in the rim on top of the blue hydrangea? You could do the same thing on the outside too. So if you wanted that, that drippy, let's see if I can get this to roll. Yeah. Now, as we wait, this will drip down. But maybe you can see it better. See how I'm rolling it on? Twisting the brush as I put this on. I would call it a pro tip. Um, <laughs> but I don't know if it's such, I don't know. <laughs> I think it's just, look at that, it's like frosting. Okay, so what do I have left to do? Well, I have one thing left to do. We don't have time, I have to wait for this to dry, but I will put light flux and I will just brush it on, on this lavender mist bowl. So that's what I got. Have I glazed the pots I made with the deep flour and seashell molds? Those just came out of the bisque. So those have not been glazed yet, so no. Um, I'm gonna be doing a lot of glazing in the next few days, actually the next few weeks. I'm hoping to have a kiln opening towards the end of the month is what I'm thinking. Open Studio Weekend is the 28th and 29th of May. So I have to have a lot of pots for all the folks who are gonna come to the studio to get pots. So I'll be, I'll be glazing like crazy till then and I've got a bunch more bisque firings to do. But I will share them all. We'll do a kiln opening when it happens. And those of you who are coming to Open Studio Weekend, you'll get to see the pots in person. So, and maybe take some home if you want. All right, everyone. Thank you for being here for this glaze tutorial. You'll be able to watch the replay anytime you want. If you want more awesome Mako glazing, be sure to check out this year's Clay Share Con. We had some great demos with Carmen from Mako. If you want to know how to do peacock glazing, check out my two classes for premium members. So you can sign up for uh, ClayShare Premium Membership. You know, we have a free trial. We have a free seven-day trial. So you can try it for free, learn peacock glazing. Maybe you want to stay. We have hundreds of full-length classes just for premium members and two private broadcasts every week for them. So, and we have a great community and giveaways and all kinds of good stuff. Uh, last thing I'm going to share is Clayscapes is doing 20% off all Mako products. That's brushes, stroke and coats, glazes, you name it. If it says Mako on it, it's 20% off. All right, thanks for being here, everyone. I will see you all next week. Premium members, I'll see you in just a few minutes. We're gonna be making pollinator drinkers. We're gonna make little garden sculptures. You have to come back and see that 